It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. to get applauded before you've said anything, is it? I must be a very popular chap because this is the third conference of mine you've all come to, so uh, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving up the World Cup, Silverstone, Wimbledon, and the Henley Regatta. So obviously all non-sporting types. Uh, but we've got a, a very full program of uh, very distinguished academics today um, and I'm sure we're going to have a, a really stimulating morning and afternoon. Uh, I would just ask, as we've got such a tight schedule, if the speakers would kindly, I'm sure they will, st stick as close as they can to the timing. Uh, Colin Wagstaff will begin to jump about and make sort of noise, noises or uh, signs like that if we're overrunning. But, um, don't panic, everybody will get a chance to uh, ask questions. We'll have two roving mics today, so uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to make yourself heard. Uh, I think one of the nicest things about today is that we're looking at both sides of the hill, uh, as is right and proper, and uh, we've got, uh, to use a transatlantic term, a great lead-off hitter today in uh, Bob Foley one of the foremost experts on the German army in the First World War. His book, uh, German Strategy and the Path to Verdun, won the Gladstone Prize from the Royal Historical Society in 2005. He's also uh, edited a book of von Schlieffen's writings, and uh, somewhere in no man's land, I gather, at the moment is a new book by Bob on uh, the German army in the First World War, which we'll all eagerly await, I'm sure. So. Uh, with further, without further ado, Bob Proley. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you all very much uh, for uh, coming out today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be sort of one of the early speakers. Uh, you can usually guarantee that the audience is is uh, is, is pretty awake and, and pretty lively, um, and that's always a, always a nice thing. I, I, I'm always sort of usually stuck kind of just after lunch, which is one of the worst times to uh, to, to, to be giving a giving a talk. Uh, and thank you all for coming out this morning as well. Again, uh, I don't know very much about kind of the sports, so I'm not really missing anything, but I, I take it there's some big ones that are going on uh, at, at the moment. Uh, so I appreciate you coming out and, and, and listening to us, to us here. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the sort of German army in 19, 1914, uh, particularly on the Western Front, because Peter's going to be uh, looking at the, at the Eastern Front. Um, I asked, was asked to sort of talk a little bit about, about with the BEF, and I, I will try to do that. Uh, but it, it's worth noting that the BEF didn't feature that prominently in German thinking in 19, 1914, um, and didn't really feature very prominently in German thinking until much, much later in, in the war. So there are some obviously some key elements and key moments when the BEF came into sort of German um, sort of uh, aspects of the, uh, of the war. But for the Germans, their main enemy on the Western Front was the French. Uh, and this was a, a key kind of element to, to, to German, German thinking about, uh, about how to prosecute the campaign, and then obviously the campaign in 19, 1914. Um, there's been a lot of writing recently about the sort of lack of enthusiasm, or at least the ambig ambiguity of enthusiasm within Germany at the outbreak of the First World War. In some respects, challenging the, the sort of previous assumptions about the uh, war enthusiasm. But there's one group that was incredibly enthusiastic for war, uh, and that was the, the German army leadership. 
Uh, recent research by people like Annika Mombauer and uh, Holger Offlebach have demonstrated the extent to which, which um, Helmut von Moltke the Younger and uh, Eric von Falkenhayn were actively pushing the government into war. Um, you may have seen sort of some of the 37 days with its caricature of, of, of both Moltke and Falkenhayn, um, but they get that element to a certain extent right. These were two people um, who were at the head of the German, German army um, or German armies who were pushing very hard for, for war to break out in, in 19, 1914. Um, the quotation here is from Eric von Falkenhayn's diary uh, from the uh, 1st of August 1914. Uh, I, I, it always sort of strikes me when I, when I, when I look at this, this, uh, this, this, this quotation um, for a, a range of reasons. One, it's, it's looking at where the mobilization order was signed, the symbolism of signing this on a, on a table constructed from wood from, uh, from, from HMS Victory. Um, and then, of course, it's the, the emotion that the two men felt uh, of, of going to war. This was something that had been long planned, had been long thought about, and then long hoped for by, by many within the, within the German army. Uh, in particular, they were looking for a settling of scores once and for all with their, uh, their, their arch enemy, the French. Um, so this was an opportunity for both Moltke and for the, the, uh, the, the rest of the German, German military establishment. And indeed, they were proud of the meticulous preparation that they had put into uh, to war. Uh, there's some statistics up here about the sort of different periods. The German army went through a mobilization period where the units were brought up to strength, bringing in reservists. And, and this reservist is an important element, and I'll keep coming back to that as we go along uh, through, this, through, this, through this talk. Um, 21,000 trains. Uh, Two, uh, two million, almost 2.1 million, 2 million men, 118,000 horses were moved in the mobilization period alone. Uh, then the German army went into its deployment period. So once the units were brought up to strength, these units were then moved to their assembly areas to be ready to, to, uh, to start the invasion of, of, of France. Again, this required about 11,000 trains, moving 3.1 million men and almost um, uh, 850,000 horses. This is a, a massive undertaking um, for, for, for any army. Now, obviously, the French are going through this. The Russians are going through this at the, at the same time. But by way of some, some comparison, in 1870, when the German army mobilized for its, its, uh, its earlier war against France, they had 1,300 um, mobilization trains moving an army of, uh, of uh, 550,000 with 157,000 horses. So you get a sense of the scale and how things have changed and moved on by 1914. And this scale and this change would create a whole host of problems for the German army, and not just the German army in, in 1914. How do you command an army of almost three million men spread out over, over hundreds of kilometers? This, is, this would create challenges that, that, that most armies would struggle with in the early days in 19, 1914. Now, the mobilization went pretty, pretty, uh, pretty smoothly. Uh, I put the slide up here about Liège because Liège was a key element to, uh, to, the, to the German deployment plan. This isn't about their, about their war plan. This is about how they move their armies and get them into position to move into, into northern, northern France. Liège offered a, uh, a key rail link. Uh, and if they didn't capture Liège, this would create all sorts of problems for the German deployment plan. Indeed, the German deployment plan had in it as, as, a, as a secret orders that if the, if the uh, attack on Liège had failed, that they would violate uh, Dutch neutrality as well uh, in order to move their armies um, uh, across, across these borders. So Liège is a key element. Uh, six brigades were held at, at, at high readiness um, uh, and moved across the, the, uh, the, the Belgian frontier on the night of uh, the 5th of August in order to take, to take this citadel by a, a coup de main. That obviously didn't, didn't happen completely. Uh, they had mixed success. Some of these brigades made it through, um, uh, and indeed bits of the fortress surrendered very, very quickly. However, the outer ring of forts didn't. Uh, and they needed to bring up these sacred, secret weapons, these super heavy howitzers, including the 42 centimeter howitzers, um, in order to, to break the back of these forts as well. It took until the 16th of August for these forts to finally, uh, uh, finally surrender uh, with some pretty spectacular destruction along, along the way, demonstrating the, the strength and the, uh, uh, um, the power of these uh, heavy, heavy, uh, super heavy howitzers uh, uh, as well. So although there was a delay in capturing Liège, it didn't really sort of impact German deployment plans uh, uh, particularly badly, and I'll, I'll come back to that too. 
uh, is a propaganda postcard um, mailed on the, uh, the 3rd of August, so before actually uh, the, the invasion of Belgium took place. Uh, it always strikes me as, a, as an interesting, interesting sort of view of, of how Germans were seeing this at the time. Uh, it, it says, uh, on, to, on to Brussels, Belgium must be ours. Uh, and you see the jackboot sort of crushing Liège as it, as it sort of comes across the, 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 uh, the, the, the river there. Um, so from very early on, you get this, this, this sense of, of Germans had a, a deep understanding of what they were wanting to accomplish um, from this, and indeed the importance of Liège, even though this is uh, ostensibly a state secret uh, at, at this stage as well. Um, the German army deployed, uh, deployed seven armies in its Western, Western army, uh, about 78 divisions or so, uh, and about 1.3 million men. Um, one army uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the east that, that Peter's going to talk about in a, in a little bit. Uh, I won't go into much, much depth in that here. But the east plays an important role in what happens in the west as well, and I'm going to touch on that uh, as we go along too. This is a uh, very a complicated map, a complex map of the of the French and German deployments in uh, in uh, in August 1914. There's no need to really sort of understand the detail of it, but but I think what you can pull away from this is the complexity of this, uh, and indeed the the depth and breadth of the of the German German deployment. And um, you can see how the how how far north the German first and second armies are. Um, and these are the sort of key armies of the, of the German right wing that are going to slash through into, into northern, northern France. And these key armies have got to squeeze through a narrow corridor uh, uh, between the sort of the, the, the German border and the, uh, and the Belgian border uh, around, around uh, Liège. Uh, so they, they've got to get in there, and Liège is absolutely crucial for rail communications. It's going to keep these two armies supplied with the, the, the material that they need, and indeed for communications back as well, and I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit too. Now, where is the German high command in this, the Oberste Hennesleitung? Well, from the 2nd to the 18th of August, they, they were uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Berlin. Um, coordinating things. The 18th of August is when the German uh, deployment, or the deployment of the German uh, uh, Western armies was complete. It's when the great army maneuver, as uh, Gerhard Tappen, the chief of operations, called it, could, be, could begin. On the 18th of August, the uh, OHL moved uh, to, to Koblenz um, in order to have some, some greater control of, of, of what, was, what was going on in the, uh, on the Western Front. Though, as we'll find, this was a real challenge. Uh, the OHL was, was going, to do, going to rely upon um, uh, telephone, telegraph, and radio communications with its armies in order to, in order to coordinate their, their activities. Um, Koblenz proved too far back. It had some real strengths, and it was based, obviously, within German territory. It had the sort of German communications um, that, were there, that were there. Uh, but as the armies advanced deeper into France, communication became more and more challenging with the, with the, uh, the, the, the OHL. Um, on the 30th of August, they moved to, to, to Luxembourg in order to be closer to the front and in order to, to communicate a little bit better. Um, but that was about as close as they could, as they could get. Moltke was tied in part by the Kaiser. Uh, the Kaiser accompanied the, the headquarters into the field, and um, it was perceived that he couldn't get too close to the front for fear of, of an attack and, and the risk to the Kaiser's life as well. So we can see some of the ways in which some of the constraints were placed on the, the, the OHL early on and how, um, how Moltke didn't, didn't want to, uh, to challenge this at, at, at this stage. And in some respects, he didn't feel the need to. When you look at the sort of view from the, the OHL, things looked like they were going really well. Uh, these are extracts from some of the reports that the OHL and, and some of the diaries of officers within the OHL uh, during, this, during the early stages of the campaign in, in, in the West. Um, on the 12th of August, the French army had been, quote, routed um, at Mulhausen by, this, by the 6th Army. Um, uh, on the 23rd of August, the 4th Army has won a great victory. You see constantly these, these terms sort of popping up of these, these, ter these wonderful victories and, and how um, the, ar the enemy armies had been routed, defeated, beaten, annihilated. Um, these are all charged terms for, 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 for German observers at the, at, at the time. And indeed, on the 25th of August, Hans von Plessen, the head of the German, German headquarters, um, wrote in his diary, 
diary that a, quote, modern day Sedan was developing on the, on the Western Front. Again, this is a charged term. This is something, this is, this is a German sort of uh, shorthand for an annihilating victory um, that, that, that was being conducted on the, on, on the Western Front. So the OHL is perceiving things in, in very rosy terms. These are the reports that they're getting back from the armies, in particular the Second Army, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that as we, as we go, go along. Um, and indeed, uh, the uh, normally quite uh, um, um, level-headed Wilhelm Groner even sort of records this in his, in his, uh, his diary on the, on the 3rd of September. I won't read you the, the, the entire quote, but you can see this up here about how enthusiastic he is about what's going on and how he believes that this is all going to plan uh, and that German victory is, is, is just within, uh, within grasp. Um, so the OHL thinks things are going really, really well on the, on the, on, at the front. Um, of course, there are some people who are, are questioning Okay, where are all the guns? Where are all the standards? Where are all the prisoners? Um, but in the heady enthusiasm of this, this, this period, um, people were, 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 quite, um, uh, were quite optimistic about, about their own chances. Uh, again, reflected in the propaganda of the day. Uh, here are the Germans having beaten the, the, uh, the, the, the French and the, and the Russians, uh, now laying into to their British allies as, as well. Um, the only real fly in the ointment uh, in the days before the, the September was what was going on on the Eastern Front. And again, I, I won't go into that in, in, any, in any real depth, um, but the initial sort of reports were that the Eighth Army was withdrawing uh, against orders um, from a, 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 the, the, the Russian enemy. And again, the sort of diary entry from, from Hans von Plassen here sort of captures the, the, the fear that, that was, that was in, the, um, uh, in, in the minds of many in the OHL about what this represented and the problems that this, that this, this would quote, uh, that this would, this would create. Um, Gerhard Toppen, again the, the, uh, the operations officer in the, in, in the OHL, wrote of this, uh, this period later, um, quote, the overwhelmingly favorable reports that arrived daily in conjunction, in conjunction with the great victory of the 6th and 7th armies in Lorraine from the 20th to the 23rd of August caused the high command to believe that the great decisive battle in the West had been fought and had gone our way. Under the influence of the, quote, decisive victory, unquote, the chief of the general staff decided that the moment had come when considerable forces could be transported to the east in order to seek a decision there as well, unquote. So on the 25th of August, uh, the OHL ordered two Army Corps and some other units to be sent to the Eastern Front in order to, to, uh, to, to stabilize the, the elements there and, to, um, and to, to, to bring about the decisive victory against the, against the Russians as well. Things looked slightly different from the front line. Um, the armies, as they were going forward, faced all sorts of issues and all sorts of problems. There's a consensus that the cavalry failed in one of its primary missions of strategic reconnaissance. It didn't know where the enemy was. Um, the first army, for example, uh, had no idea where the BEF was. Uh, were they uh, on the continent at all? Some intelligence suggested that they hadn't even landed. Um, other intelligence suggested that they were at Lille, some that they were in, at Antwerp. Um, they, nobody had any real idea of where the BEF might be found, or indeed much of the French army. Where, where was this? Um, this caused the, the first army, for example, to heavily echelon its, its forces to the, to the right as it was advancing through, uh, uh, through Belgium into northern France. So when the first army met the, the BEF at Mons, it, its echelon forces had to come a much greater distance in order to, come in, to get into the battle as well. So um, the first army wasn't in a good position to, to uh, decisively defeat the BEF or, or indeed that entire wing of the French army because it didn't really know where these elements were. So this uncertainty on the battlefield was a, was a key element in which, in which the, armies, the armies operated. Um, another kind of key thing was the state of the army itself, particularly as the, as the campaign developed and as it, as it went, went, went forward. Um, the quotation here is from the deployment directives of, that the OHL uh, uh, issued uh, at the out outbreak of the war that stressed the need and the importance of, of uh, protecting these reservists. Um, most of the German army was made up of reservists. 
These were people who were called back to the colors and who fleshed out these units on, on mobilization. Um, the youngest people were, were obviously um, reasonably fit, but many of them had been out of the army for, for a considerable period of time and were no longer at the peak of their, their physical, physical fitness. So ostensibly, there was great care to be, to be given to these reservists, that the marches weren't to be too exhausting, particularly in the early stages of the, of the campaign, while these, these men took their time to, uh, uh, to, to get back into, into shape, and while indeed the units sort of came together and, 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 and fleshed, fleshed out. The reservists were the backbone of this German army, um, and this is in active army units as well as the reserve units. About half of the, uh, of the active units were made up of the younger um, uh, reservists, and then obviously there were reserve units that were about a quarter um, uh, active duty personnel, and uh, the rest made up of various classes of reservists of various ages as, as well. Um, however, this wasn't always the case. Um, German propaganda would sort of, sort of have us see these, uh, these fit young men marching off to war, surrounded by the, the ghosts of their ancestors, uh, surrounded by the ghost of Moltke the, Moltke the Elder, um, uh, Blücher, uh, uh, Frederick the Great. Um, the reality, of course, was, was, was very much different. The Third Reserve Corps, for example, had lost over 1,000 men by the 14th of August. This is before operations had really, really begun. These are men who are falling out because they, they couldn't keep up with the, with the, the physical re re regime. The Seventh Reserve Corps um, was uh, termed by its, its, uh, its commanding officer, Hans von Zwell, uh, as, quote, not suitable for modern war, unquote. Uh, this is a, 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 a well sort of uh, uh, experienced officer who was looking at his reservists saying, look, these guys just aren't up to this, these modern day campaigns and the demands of these, these modern day campaigns. Um, the Seventh Reserve Corps was asked to march 150 kilometers in, uh, in, in five days uh, from the 20th to the 20, 25th of August, um, a considerable um, sort of area. I was looking on the map on the, on the train on the, on the way up, or I was looking at a, a, a news story about the Tour de France, and there's a leg that goes from Cambridge to, 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 to London that's 155 kilometers. Um, so can you imagine walking that in, in, in five days, fighting along the way as well? It gives you some sense of, of what these guys were, were, um, were, were up against here. Um, again, a, a uh, slightly complex map, one you, you probably won't be able to, won't be able to see very well. Um, but I put this up here to highlight the movements of, this is the map of the, the movements of the First Army um, from the 20th of August um, uh, up, up to uh, the, uh, the, the 5th of September. Um, it gives a sense of, of how far these, these men are, are, are marching. And in particular, the corps and the units that marched the furthest in the, the Western campaign in 1914 were the reservists. It was the uh, 7th Reserve Division, which was part of the, the 4th uh, Reserve Corps, which was on the outer, outermost wing of the, uh, of the, the, the German, German right wing. Between the 17th of August and the 5th of, of, of September, it marched 471 kilometers. So an incredible sort of a, amount of, 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 of space that these reservists, these you know, sort of part-time soldiers, were being, were being asked, to, asked to do. But it wasn't just the reserve units that were, were, were suffering. Uh, on the 27th of August, the, um, uh, the 19th Army Corps, an active duty Army Corps, uh, reported, his commanding general reported, quote, um, he could not guarantee that they would be fit for combat um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a future battle because of the exertions of the marching that they were, they were going through and obviously fighting along the way as they, as they, as they went. So the German army was, was, was having to go this great distance on foot, um, uh, quite obviously, um, and uh, made up of people who were not always suitable for, for modern war in, in, the, in the view of its own, of its own generals. There are other problems as well, too. Um, there are a range of tactical issues that they faced. Um, some research, some recent research, would have us believe that the, the German army in 1914 was a paragon of tactical virtue. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, there were good units and bad units, as with, with every army, but consistently there was a problem, uh, and that's its, its units, uh, its infantry attacked 
without waiting for, for artillery support in, in early 1914. There was a consistent problem that was seen by the OHL and by observers at the, at, at the front that, that these units would, would, uh, would go forward, cost what it may, uh, to use the term from the, the, the German um, uh, regulations for, for, for the infantry for 19, 1914. Uh, I'm going to give one example. It's a, it's a rather extreme example, but I, I think sort of captures this, uh, this, this problem in essence. This is the uh, infantry regiment, 116th Infantry Regiment, again, an active duty, duty regiment, uh, a regiment that, that, that should have known sort of better and, and, and should have been at the peak of its, of its, of its powers. Um, it had its baptism of fire on the 27th of August uh, against a, a French enemy in place in, uh, in, in the woods around a village called uh, Anloy. Um, there were, the regiment had 70 officers and uh, 2,921 men um, in it and, and who attacked on, on, on this, this day. Um, by the time the day was over, 50% uh, of the officers, 36 officers would be casualties, and 35% of the men, uh, 1,011, were, 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 were casualties. Uh, this was the bloodiest day that this regiment faced in the entire war. Uh, the second bloodiest was at Verdun, uh, when they suffered 25% casualties uh, in, in, in terms of officers and 25% in, in, in men. So it gives you a sense of sort of the high sort of scale of casualties that were going on. Now the problem for the 116th uh, Infantry Regiment is that it attacked without waiting for any type of support at all. It attacked without waiting for, for uh, artillery support or even uh, to deploy its machine guns to provide support in this attack as well. The infantry um, just, just launched into an attack against the French who were, who were dug in in, in in woods. They couldn't see the French. They didn't know the, the, the strength of the, of the, of the, the French enemy. Um, and they got, they got stuck into to a, uh, a, a, a dirty close quarters battle that a, a sort of accounts talk about of being with a bayonet and entrenching tools uh, without any particular support whatsoever. Um, so this accounts for these, these high casualties of this day as well. And this was replicated, if not in such an extreme fashion, across the front. Uh, units were attacking without waiting for any artillery preparation, without uh, coordinating any artillery support, um, which meant uh, that, they, that it was a, a, an infantry on infantry battle or an infantry uh, against an enemy supported by artillery and, and machine guns as, as well. Uh, so the German infantry suffered horrendously um, by, uh, in, in these types of attacks. Now, this is reflected in casualty figures. Um, the, the, the Western Army um, lost a total of 136,417 men uh, uh, by, in, in August alone. Uh, this, is, this is before we get into, into September. Uh, the Western Army had lost uh, 265,000 or so um, by the 6th of September. So it gives you a sense of the scale of the, of, of the losses that are, that are going on. The average army strength on the, in the Western, uh, of the Western armies was 155,000. So again, it gives you a sense of the, of the scale of German losses. Um, this is even before uh, the, the, the battle, battle of the Marne. Now, what can we see as some of the problems and, and challenges that emerge from this? Well, some of the issues are, 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 are around command. Um, there was a real disconnect between the, the, the uh, high command and what went on uh, at, at, at the front. Uh, the distance grew uh, and the complexity of communications grew as the, the, uh, the German armies advanced deeper and deeper into, into France. And so the OHL had, had expected to rely upon sort of modern communications, expected to rely on, on telegraph, telephone, and, um, uh, and radio to sort of keep, keep up with what was going on with these, with these armies. That didn't, that didn't really work. On the eve of the Marne in early September, the OHL only had good communications with the 3rd, 4th, and 5th armies on the Western Front. So there are three armies that, that it had only limited communica communications with. The first and second armies, the, the quote unquote decisive armies, they only had radio communications and with that quite patchy. The first army only had one transmitter that was capable of, of, of reaching the OHL um, and it often took 24 hours for messages to pack, pass back and forth between the OHL and the, the first and second armies. This was such a problem that by, by the Battle of the Marne, messages were arriving too late 
the first and second armies had advanced too far um, and, and had, were, were doing things on their own and outside what the OHL was requiring of them um, uh, as time went on as well. It's also created challenges. How do you communicate between your armies? Uh, Kraft von Delmenzingen, the chief of staff of the, the Sixth Army, uh, complained in his diary uh, uh, of the problems created by these modern communications. And uh, I'll read this to you, quote, one can only give the barest of details over radio because everything has to be encoded. This is a drudgery, a true exchange of opinions, uh, such that can be seen in the files of the campaigns from Moltke the Elder's time is barely possible, unquote. So this element of being able to communicate and exchange information about what was going on in the front with the, with the high command uh, simply wasn't, wasn't possible. So the OHL relied heavily on liaison officers moving forward into, to, 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 the, to the front uh, in order to, to sort of gain a sense of what was going on, but also to bring its orders forward. Now, obviously, the most famous of those was Richard Hench um, that, that went forward during the Battle of the Marne and, and ultimately resulted in the withdrawal of the, of the, the first and, 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 and second armies. But this was happening throughout the campaign uh, in, in the East. Um, and uh, these relatively junior officers are, are moving forward, trying to sort of make sense of what's going on without themselves having a real good understanding of what's happening on the front either. Mm -hmm. So communication is, is a serious problem. Understanding is a serious problem as, as, as time goes on. Um, I, I put up this, this diagram here. This is a diagram of, of uh, the, uh, the doctrine for uh, communications. In, uh, in 1914 that was existent in, in 19, 1914. Now, what we can see in this is a, is a couple issues that, that, that emerged during the campaign as well. Um, note that there's no lateral communication between the armies. The armies were expected to communicate with each other via the OHL and via, um, via sort of um, Germany itself. So um, there's very little sort of attempt to, to create a communications net between armies. So the first and second army, as they're advancing, and the third and fourth, as, uh, as they're advancing into, into northern France, um, wasn't able to communicate directly with each other. Uh, so again, they relied heavily on liaison officers going back and forward between these, these, uh, these commands as well. Again, relatively junior officers often who are, are trying to ca carry messages and trying to find each other um, in, in, the, uh, in the chaos of these, the, the, these battlefields. The other problem that they had was a lack of communications troops. Um, the uh, head of the field um, uh, communications troops was in the second echelon of the OHL, um, which was further back in, in Germany as well. So he wasn't even brought forward. He didn't know some of the problems that were going on of the communications with the OHL in the front and communications between, between armies as well. So you get a problem of, of not just sort of doctrine of how you're going to do things, but also the, the um, uh, limited number of troops and their ability to actually affect communications between units as, as well. So they've got real problems of communication um, that, that are going on between armies and between the armies and the, and the OHL, sometimes even within armies. So units are moving forward and their troops aren't, aren't actually sort of keeping pace. The communication troops aren't keeping pace with the advance because they're having to lay cable um, and, uh, and, and, and try to keep up with, with, with the advance. German army only also had 35 radio transmitters in, in 1914, so not enough to, 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 to go around either. Another problem, of course, you get is how do you actually sort of command over this vast scale? Again, I alluded to sort of the, the, the differences between 1870 and 19, 1914. In 1870, there are three German armies, 550,000 men. Um, in, uh, in, in 1914, of course, there are seven armies uh, in, in, uh, of, of well over a, a million men spread out over an immense distance with communications as a, as a challenge as well. This is an area before sort of developments in command, such as army groups. So each army, in effect, is fighting its own battle uh, as the German army is advancing into, into, into northern France. The OHL was meant to play a coordinating role, but with limited communications and limited understanding of what was going on in the front, can only really sort of um, exercise that command with the third, fourth, and fifth armies, the armies closest to it, and the armies that, quite frankly, are, are not the most crucial, crucial armies. Um, so it's sending messages, it's sending liaison officers to the, to the first and second armies on the right wing and the sixth army in particular on the, on the, uh, on the left wing um, without really sort of getting a 
sense of what, what's going on. And when you read the diaries of these, uh, these commands um, from the, 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 the first, second, and, and the sixth armies, you know, they're often exacerbated by what the OHL is asking them to do. Um, they, they don't get a sense that the OHL understands what's, what, 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 what conditions are like uh, at, at the front at, at, at as well. The other issue you get, you get of course, is challenges of, of command. Of course, each of these armies is equal. Each of these army commanders is equal. And each thinks that they have the, 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 the secret to victory. Again, you particularly get this uh, on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the right wing, the first and second armies. Uh, uh, Kluck and Bulo didn't get along. Bulo, in particular, had a, had a very sort of um, um, a very well-defined view of, of what battle should look like and, and how battle should be conducted. His view of battle is, is very much a, a closed order event. Um, so when gaps sort of developed between the second army and the third army and the, and, and, and the first army, this, fr uh, this threw Bulo into, into a tizzy. Um, and again, you look at the diaries of the time, and his liaison officers are moving to the, to the, to the armies to the right and, and left of him, saying, look, close up. We've got, to, we've got to close these gaps. The first army, commanded by Kluck, couldn't care less. You know, they didn't care about, about these gaps. They were happy operating kind of on their own. The third army was a little bit, a little bit more cognizant of it uh, and fell under the, the, the second army sort of sway a little, bit, a little bit more. But you get these various sort of ideas about how battle should be conducted and who should be sort of winning this quote unquote decisive, decisive victory. Um, indeed, where was this to come from? Is it the first army that's to deliver this blow? Is it the second army? Uh, uh, Kluck and, and Bulo both, be both believed that it was their army that was, that, was, that was there to do it. This even extended within the armies as well. Second army is, again, a good example. Um, Bulo had a terrible relationship with at least two of his corps commanders. Um, he wasn't even on speaking terms with, with two of these men. Um, from issues that came up, some of which pre-war, some of which from early days of the war a, a, as well. So he didn't trust them. They didn't trust the second, second army. So you get these problems even within the sort of the, the, the German, German, uh, German armies of problems of, 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 uh, of, of command. There's also the issue of personnel. Um, some of this is reflected in the health issues that, that began to emerge as the campaign developed. Uh, and indeed, I, I don't think this is simply a, a German army issue. I mean, you see this obviously in the BEF too, with, with senior officers either dropping dead of heart attacks or, or, uh, or, or, or essentially being too stressed to, to, to carry out their, their roles. Similar things were happening in the, in, in the German army too. Uh, and I, I think we don't really sort of appreciate the impact, the, the, the mental impact this had on these commanders. This kind of uh, the, the pressures of time and space that they simply weren't able to deal with effectively. Um, we know, for example, that, that Bulo certainly struff, suffered a, at least a minor stroke during, the, uh, during this, this campaign that put him out of action for, for, for a day or two. His chief of staff, um, uh, Otto von Lauenstein, was also quite ill um, during, during this campaign and wasn't able to, to exercise his duties effectively. So real sort of operational sort of decisions were being made by relatively junior members of the, uh, of the, the second army staff. On top of that, Lauenstein was the German army's uh, Russian army expert. And he'd spent the majority of his career in Russia studying the Russian army, which begs the question, why wasn't he chief of staff of the 8th army? Um, why was it Valderze, um, who didn't have any real innate understanding of the, of the, of the, um, uh, 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 of the Russian army? Similarly, you look at the, the first army. Uh, uh, Kuhl was the German army's French army expert. Yet it's the first army is likely to, to, to meet the, the British expeditionary force. So there's some pretty interesting questions about decisions that are made about, about command and about the suitability of people for, for command within the German army as well. Uh, of course, it's not just these men who are, who are, who are problem, facing problems with their health. Um, Hausen, the third army commander, was retired on, on health grounds um, soon after the Battle of the Marne. Moltke himself, um, there are many indications that, that he had problems with the, with the stresses and the, and the problems of the campaign, indeed even before uh, the campaign had, had, had begun. So we see this sort of range of problems that, that, that emerge um, uh, sort of on the eve of the Battle of the Marne. The German army, by the time it reached the Marne, is stretched in, in many different, different senses. It's stretched in terms of, it, of its physical ability to keep, keep fighting. Um, its reservists are, are, are suffering. Indeed, even its active duty units are, are suffering from the exertions of these, of these uh, modern day campaigns. 
Uh, and indeed, its command structure is suffering too. Uh, it's suffering from the issues of communication and lack of knowledge about what's going on and good knowledge about what's going on in the front, uh, whether that's in front of an army or, or a particular unit or whether it's higher up at the, at the, the OHL. Communication between the units and the different various levels of command was also beginning to sort of suffer by the time of the, uh, of the Battle, Battle of the Marne. Um, you get issues of, of health and, uh, and indeed suitability for, for, for this uh, high pressure, um, high, high paced campaign in, in, in France as well. Uh, are these the right men? Can they actually do this? Um, by the time they reach the Battle of the Marne, there are serious tensions within the Western, Western army. Um, of course, the OHL thinks that victory is, is, is almost there. The armies are, 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 less, um, uh, are less sanguine about this um, and indeed are reaching the stage where they're, 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 they're desperately in the need of a pause and a rest in order to, in order to refit and to, uh, and to, to recharge uh, a, a, as well. Um, so by the time the German army reaches the Marne, it has these, these inherent sort of problems and, and difficulties that are, that are, that are within it. Uh, and, and it's struggling to overcome these. Um, the issue in terms of, of, of the, the Marne itself, again, you see these, emergence, the, these problems emerge in response to the battle. Uh, Bulow is uh, uh, um, over, the, over the moon, or, or he's, he's, he senses the, the great difficulty, the great challenge, that the gap that's been created between the first and second armies into which the BEF, amongst other units, um, advance. Um, the first army doesn't really care about this. They're worried about the sixth, French Sixth Army emerging from Paris, and importantly, German cavalry units that are, that are operating in its rear echelons as well, that are creating problems for its supply um, and, and creating problems for, for, its, for its operations as well. So you get these two armies that are concerned with very different things um, by the time the Battle of the Marne breaks out. When the OHL representative reaches these armies, uh, it's got, he has to try to make sense of what's going on. Um, and he's got to try to evaluate the sort of where these armies are, their strengths, their weaknesses, et, et, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and indeed, he is the one that, 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 that decides that, that to, to order this withdrawal. Now, of course, the evidence at the, the time really suggests that this is meant to be a tactical withdrawal, to buy the German army a bit of time in order to, in order to, to regroup and to attack again. Um, uh, but we all know that doesn't, that doesn't happen for a variety, variety of, of, of reasons. Um, and of course, the German army is, is struggling even with this bit of time that, that the withdrawal buys to, uh, to, to reform itself. And it's falling back into the chaos of its, of its uh, rear area too uh, that create additional problems, et cetera. I think I will end this, 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 this there, and I'm happy to sort of take some questions, including after the Marne, if people are, are interested in that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.